It's a big, hard world out there, but you're ready for it. And you're ready because there is nothing more powerful than you using your personality to serve the calling of your soul. Every one of us has been called to the planet to use, and in this moment, in this political moment where everybody is just hysterical, in this moment, the call is for whatever side you choose to be on, to use more of you to bring forth the light. And to do that, you've got to have clarity about who you really are. There is no life without a spiritual life. There is no life without understanding what Pierre de Chardin, the philosopher and mystic said, we are spiritual beings having a human experience. So your real job as you go out to try to find one and have all of this anxiety and fear and your real job is to know the truth and to create a spiritual practice that allows you to stay in it. To be clear, I'm not talking about your religion. I'm talking about whatever it is that nurtures the essence of you in such a way that you can do what you came here to do. And one of the reasons why I was able to be so successful all those years on The Oprah Show is because I understood there was really no difference between me and the audience. I was a surrogate for the audience because I know that the audience and you and you and you want the same thing I do. We all want to be able to live out the truest expression, the fullest, purest expression of ourselves as human beings. That's what you want. And in order to do that, you've got to practice, you've got to develop that spiritual muscle that allows you to check in with yourself and not have to ask everybody else about a decision, but to have the clarity of your own knowing, the comfort of your own knowing. And to do that, you've got to live in the space of gratitude. That is my number one spiritual practice. I practice being grateful. And a lot of people say, oh, Oprah, that's easy for you because you got everything. I got everything because I practiced being grateful. I ran across this beautiful quote the other day. I can't even remember who it was from that said, do not waste your time desiring what other people have. Remember the things that you now have are things you once only hoped for. So I live in that space every day of practicing gratitude because I know that being grateful wherever you are, whatever place or space in your life, being grateful changes your personal vibration. I was just having a conversation with Sheryl Sandberg the other day about her book Option B and we all know she lost her beloved husband David and I said, how did you get through it? And she said, by practicing gratitude. I didn't believe it at first, but I started to write down three things every day that I was grateful for. I said, oh, I've been doing that for years. Because when you wake up in the morning, looking at the world for what you're gonna write down or what you're gonna state to yourself by the end of the day that you're grateful for, you have a different outlook on life. I'm just waiting on somebody to hold the door, see if that makes the list. Some days you only have, I'm still breathing. Because life gets in the way sometimes. But practicing gratitude as a spiritual practice to evolve you, to bring you closer to the truth of knowing who you really are, is one of the most valuable things I have ever, ever experienced. And I do it. I have journals and journals and journals and journals filled with five things a day. If you don't believe me, just for a moment, do this. Close your eyes, everybody in here. We're gonna do this for five seconds. You're gonna inhale, and on the exhale, just say, thank you. Inhale. Exhale. Do it 
it one more time. Let the, whatever you're most grateful for in your heart in this moment just rise to the surface. Deep breath. Thank you. Open your eyes. Don't you feel better? You feel better. Researchers have shown that if you can just for 17 seconds a day, 17 seconds a day, bring yourself into the space of presence and gratitude, you literally change your vibration. If you can't give yourself 17 seconds, then you don't deserve a good life. You can't give yourself 17 seconds to breathe and say thank you, then just let whatever happens, happens to you. Finally, I leave you with these words. I'm so happy to see my friend Chip Babcock, who is my attorney here. His wife, Nancy, is a trustee here. And Chip and I go way back to 1998, where I was on trial for saying something bad about a burger. It's under, Oprah said something bad about a burger. So I said something bad about a burger, and I was on trial in Texas for six weeks, night and day, nine to five, on the witness stand for days, testifying about burgers. And I was confused. I was like, I don't understand. I was a mess. I was a wreck. I forgot about intention. I forgot about... And I had to get myself still. It was hard to be still because the cattlemen, they wanted to take me down. Okay, so I'm on the witness stand, stand being tried for saying something bad about a burger. And the prosecutor is saying, you young lady conspired to bring down the entire beef industry. Did you not? And you strategized with your team and you came up with the idea that you were going to do everything you could to take out the cattle industry. Did you not? So I didn't. The more he was spitting on me and charging me with, this, this, this really struck me. At one point he says, this young lady is a liar because she knew and deliberately tried to take my clients out. It's offensive when you're called a liar and you're not. And the more he spit and the more he railed and ranted, something happened to me in the midst of this crisis. I started to get still, which is my prayer for you. I started to get still. The crazier he got, the calmer I became. And finally, when he called me a liar, I knew in that moment, well now, that is not my truth. You can say a lot of things, but I am not a liar, and I did not conspire to take down the entire beef industry. And the more still I became, the happier I got. I'm in the midst of this trial. Chip can tell you, I came off the witness stand and I went, that was great. He said, why? I said, because I got to see and figure out who I really was in the face of being called a liar, being called a conspirator, being told who I was not. And what I know is all trial, everybody goes through trials. I just happen to be in an actual trial. All people, if you live long enough, there's going to be a trial in your life. It may be disease, it may be jobs, it may be any number of crises that stand outside yourself to try to tell you who you are. Are you not? And it is your job to know the truth and let that truth set you free. a long time to realize for some of us speaking for myself that we must become that which we see when we're looking for love when we're looking for validation peace hope all of those things are found within 
I read a story of a man on his dying bed. His wife had come to see him and he had given her everything she ever wanted in life and took care of her for many, many years. And on his dying bed, she said, what will I do without you? I don't know how to do this and what am I going to do? I'm just going to be lost. And his last words to her was, you have everything you need within you. And I think that that is true of all of us. We have all that we need within us. And self-love is not selfish. And it's important, as we've heard and been told, that it's okay to love people from a distance. We don't have to wish people harm that harm us. And yes, hurt people hurt others. And the best thing that we can do is to maintain our highest self our highest state, and that is a state of love and gratitude. And when you can reach that state, you literally will radiate love and gratitude. Scientists have said three meters from the body that they can see it. Some of you guys walk around and people just are attracted to you. They, they just start talking to you. And there's a reason for that. It's because you are radiating love and peace and, and a comfortability for others to approach you. Everything goes year and yang. I almost said there's no higher emotion because it's that's absolutely not true. You have to but you get to choose. You get to decide, am I going to be loving today or not? Am I going to live in a peaceful or hostile universe? Which is a question that Einstein poses. And each day that you wake up with vision, you don't necessarily have enough sight. My grandfather was blind, but he had a lot of vision. Then you get to decide that today I choose to live in a peaceful universe and spread love, joy, and peace everywhere to everyone.